thankfully we are a little bit beyond that. The future is amazing stuff they got coming on board. Who knows what it'll, what it'll all mean, but... Yeah, and UFOs, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Who's are they? Are they the Chinese, the Russians? Or are they the aliens from Mexico? I don't know. <laughs> I think we're going to have a lot of those all over the place. Yeah. I think they're demonic, personally. Yeah. But, um, Could be. <sighs> I mean, they, they move in unearthly ways, ways that no human really could endure. Well, oh, the UFOs? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They go, go yeah. bzz, yeah, they're just moving all over the place, and they'll go under the yeah, water. That, that's back. the camera. They can't hold the camera still. Yeah, right. <laughs> Come on, hold still. <laughs> <laughs> How come they're always so grainy and whatnot? <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah, all you see is a little, little pinpoint of light, and they say, that's a UFO. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're showing them today they were triangular. Yeah. That's the other thing, they're kind of weird shape or like geometrical shapes, an oval or triangle, uh, different things like that. So I I don't think that they are this worldly myself. But hmm. you're out there read about, you can read about that in the book by Gary North, Unholy Spirits. Yeah. Uh, would, you, would you think there's a rise in all of that right now? It certainly seems like it. I think there's a rise in demonic activity in our country. Oh, yeah, I believe and, it. And with that will be uh, more and more uh, these kinds of uh, appearances and displays. And I, I, I kind of think that you'll at some point, you know, if we are in that generation, the man of sin will appear kind of in one of these kinds of things as an alien from space as it were or something like that but anyway <clears throat> wouldn't surprise me yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think his uh, problems with uh, mental stability are encouraging adventurous activities by the Russians and the Chinese oh I bet they, they, that's yeah. the danger of having someone like that yeah. with a whole administration of them they don't They're think he's up to the task weak and useless Hey, uh, this is a time you certainly don't want to have someone like that running the show. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Um, well, it's like we sent two warships, I think at least two warships, into the uh, Black Sea, and Russia got all upset, and we backed out. <laughs> it's like what Trump said politicians are all talking, no action. You know? Just, uh, we have the freedom of navigation there in the Black Sea, we've got every right to be there, so. Let's be there. But anyway, mm. I digress. Yeah. Um, ah, good deci I decided that we would make our way through this section on discipling children um, rather than skipping over it. Um, understanding that uh, most of us, if not all of us, are not personally directly involved in ra raising children at the moment. You all have uh, broader relationships with uh, family and friends, um, children, grandchildren rather, nieces and nephews and that sort of thing. So there's opportunities there to talk to family members about biblical standards for raising children. And to our culture today, uh, really the future, as they say, is in our children. So if we are developing a culture that raises children in a godless manner, then you can't be surprised when the culture becomes godless and wicked. So um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's important that we have a clear understanding of what a uh, biblical way of raising children is, uh, and that can influence perhaps the way we vote for uh, candidates for office. Uh, it will influence perhaps our relationship to public schools, community colleges, state schools, things like that. Um, so I think uh, there's a lot to consider here. And then more broadly, many of the principles here can also be used in your own discipling of uh, younger men, uh, 
members of your family, uh, as you develop relationships with others and seek to develop the work of Christ and the hearts of others, uh, you'll see that many of the principles That's applied cool. here can be helpful in those arrangements as well. So um, I thought it'd be helpful in a variety of ways to do that. And um, I'm mindful as well that uh, we record these videos and I post them where others can see them. And sometimes we'll get younger parents with families that can take part or benefit from it. So there are multiple of reasons for going ahead with that. And uh, so that's, that's what we'll do unless there's huge objection and outrageous outcries, <laughs> massive protests, <laughs> tomatoes being thrown at the speaker. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't live in Portland or Seattle or that's right. <laughs> Minneapolis. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Uh, what a mess out there. Well, let's begin with prayer, and then uh, we'll get started today. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can come before you this morning. We thank you for uh, these days where we can gather for fellowship, for uh, the meditation on your word. We pray that your blessing will be on our study into raising children. We pray, Lord, that you would grant us grace to understand these things for ourselves, and we pray that you would equip us that we would be able to help others as well. We pray for our, our families, uh, we pray for our churches and the families within our churches, and pray, Lord, for your blessing on them. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing in the Masculine Mandate. Uh, we're on Chapter 9 today, and uh, I have it up on your screen for you. Um, as I was reading that, uh, I... Uh, I picked up one of the books off of my shelf to give myself a little bit of background information on this, and I was noticing a, um, a considerable overlap in point of view between uh, Dr. Phillips and Ted Tripp. I don't know if you've come across this book by him, Shepherding a Child's Heart. Uh, that will take, I think, many of the concepts that you have in these chapters uh, even a little bit further. and. Uh, develop them. I'm, I didn't check to see which one came first. <laughs> um, Tripp wrote in 1995, so I guess his was... The Ten early. trips, probably. Yeah, probably so. And uh, so maybe uh, Dr. Phillips was benefited by uh, Ted Tripp's work. I don't know. But at any rate, there are similar points of view there. Uh, developing a, a bit of a reformed uh, idea of uh, raising children. Um, there are others that you can consult with a broader area of uh, interest. Um, Jay Adams will have some things that are of help and, uh, and there are others as well. So we'll get started here with Dr. Phillips and uh, I think he, he makes some very important uh, points here as we go along and I'll try to make my own contributions to the discussion too. So, uh, can you, all of you see uh, the, the chapter that I have up here on the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. One lament common to Christian fathers goes something like this. Pastor, I don't know how this happened. He has gone to church his whole life. We have taken him to Sunday school and vacation Bible school and paid for Christian school tuition. We have monitored his friends to make sure they come from good families, and we spanked him when he was little. I thought those things would keep this from happening. Uh, that's the cry of the heart, I think, of probably many Christian parents at times when uh, they raise a child and they try to do so with uh, sincere motives and great concern for the spiritual well-being of their child, and yet much to their chagrin, their disappointment, frustration, uh, they find that their child grows up um, with a rebellious spirit, perhaps, uh, getting into trouble in uh, ways that would shock and uh, certainly discourage. And the thought is, well, how did this happen if I have been doing all these things? You know, I, I've, I've done my job of putting the input in 
for a child to develop a Christian character and, and grow from there. If I did my job in putting in the input, how is it that the outcome is very disappointing at best? And that, that's a, a challenge that comes across uh, Christian families, parents, uh, fathers, uh, as they go, go through this. Um, I know, too, you know, speaking more broadly, I mean, this particular instance was one of a, a father who really did a lot for his child with uh, school, vacation Bible school, Christian school. He's trying to do what he can for that child. Um, but there are many who uh, feel that uh, their religious education for the child comes from when they come to church on Sunday and they get that hour in the worship service or so and maybe they'll stay for a Sunday school uh, and then uh, the children go off to a public school for the rest of the week. They go off to a secular college and they wonder why at 18, 20 years of age their child is abandoning their Christian faith and not attending a church anywhere and perhaps engaged in all kinds of things. So how could this be? Well, um, I think that uh, parents like that need to understand that as we raise our children we have to give them a comprehensive Christian education uh, and I, I think if you let the world disciple your child then you can't be surprised if the child follows the world when uh, that time comes for the child to go out on its own. Dr. Phillips says the child, excuse me, the child in this all too familiar story who may be male or female may have gotten in, involved in drugs, gotten pregnant, or rejected the faith. The father's underlying assumption is that providing a Christian structure for children is sufficient to ensure their godliness. If we can just control their school, their church, their books, their friends, their television diet, and their computer use, we think we can guarantee a comprehensive Christian faithfulness. This belief is false. To follow it is a recipe for a potential disaster. Now, that last paragraph, which is just two short sentences, might shock you uh, to read that. You say, okay, well, why then do I do all this? Why then do I take my children to church and pay Christian school tuition and watch over them and care for them if uh, that's not going to do, do the job? Well, there's a lot of things that go on into this whole process, and uh, Dr. Phillips is going to uh, give uh, his perspective on these things. Uh, he's going to talk about the importance of winning your child's heart and the important role that the heart plays in life. So that's going to be uh, obviously uh, very important and provide greater context for all these other things that were done. Um, I would say you, know, you still have to be mindful of the fact that even though you, you raise your child in a godly home, in a Christian environment, and uh, you bring them to church, they're under the discipline of the church, the fellowship of the saints, and so forth, perhaps they have a Christian education as well through the week. Even so, this is not a mechanical process. It's not something where you, you put in your input and out comes the desired result. Um, there are issues of election involved here, of God's work of grace in a child's heart, the changing of that child's heart. And so you can raise a child according to godly standards and even follow what Dr. Phillips, I think, is going to argue for in terms of trying to reach that child's heart. But in the end, it's the child's heart. You, you cannot manipulate it. It's the child's heart, and the child is responsible for its own response to uh, what you're doing for that child. And then two, um, ultimately and finally, it, it's God's work in the child's heart causing that child to change. There, there are, you know, just as you might lament a, a child raised in a Christian family or in a good, solid Christian church and so forth, and yet nonetheless abandoning the faith and going off on their own years later, you can have a different story with a, a, a child and, and a broken family and uh, raised in the public school and that sort of thing, but coming to faith in Christ through the witness of another classmate or something and ha having a wonderful life as a Christian uh, servant of Christ. So, you know, we have to 
remind ourselves that God is sovereign in all of these things and in the outcome of our child's heart and disposition, uh, there's still the sovereignty of God at work in these things and then to the individual responsibility of the child in response to uh, God's Word. So just some larger uh, framework to keep in mind as we begin to look at uh, raising children. I, I think it's important to keep that in our minds. And so um, when you have a child like in this situation that has gone off on its own, um, it is a, a reason for grief, for mourning and uh, sorrow. Um, but I would encourage you to continue to pray and you might remember the great old story of St. Augustine long ago and his mother Monica who prayed for him. And Rick can correct me on this, but I think he was about 30 years of age or so before he came to faith in Christ. I, I don't recall for sure, but um, he, he had um, become an instructor in rhetoric and uh, adopted um, uh, various heretical ideas. But his mother continued to pray for him. And God did a wonderful work in his life, and he will the rest of his history. Or in the words of an old radio broadcaster, and now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> I forget the name of that. Paul Harvey. I used to listen to him down in Texas, uh, Brownwood, Texas, on the radio coming out of WABC in Dallas. That's kind of a fun memory. Okay, so... Now we're going to talk about raising children and discipling children. You'll, you'll pay attention to the heading of the, this particular chapter to work, the discipling of children. And uh, he's going to bring in those ideas now at this point. Uh, Fathers and the Masculine Mandate. As I hope is clear by now, the main premise of this book is that the mandate of Genesis 2 verse 15 summarizes our calling as men in our various roles. God put Adam in the garden to work it and keep it. And the only difference between Adam's calling and ours lies in the details of how we seek to fulfill it. So far I have laid the doctrinal groundwork for this position and developed the theme within marriage, where a woman is to be built up and kept safe by her husband. But does this mandate apply to a man's calling as father? It absolutely does. In fact, according to the Bible, the, only, the, excuse me, the two main obligations of fatherhood are to nurture or work and protect or keep. A man is called to work the hearts of his children that they might become fertile soil for the gospel and devotion to Christ. And... A man is called to keep and protect his children from the influences of sin in the world and in their own hearts, so that all the efforts to draw that young person's heart to Christ may not be swept away. So again, he takes those principal ideas out of the Garden of Eden, uh, working and keeping the garden. He applies it to marriage, and now he's going to apply those same ideas to raising children. And... The beginning of the chapter talked about discipling, and that's going to be this working in the garden, cultivating the garden, this discipleship, really, within the heart of a child. So he says, it is good. Okay, I believe I... No, I didn't finish that. It is good and, yes, even necessary for Christian parents to provide a solid and wholesome spiritual structure for their children. But there is no substitute for parents, on the one hand, personally discipling their children in the Lord, and on the other hand, discipling them as necessary. Note the difference, excuse me, disciplining them as necessary. Uh, I should pay attention here. Note the difference in spelling. Discipline, covered in the next chapter, is essential as an act of keeping. But it cannot take the place of discipling, an act of working, the process of bonding with our children so as to guide their hearts personally to faith in Jesus. So the key ideas here are discipling and disciplining. And so positively we are discipling our child, seeking them to help them to grow to faith in Christ and to live for Him. 
At the same time, we are disciplining our child, uh, putting a fence around the child to protect the child from harm, and uh, disciplining the child uh, as well to protect the child from harmful behaviors that will bring uh, trouble into their lives. Discipling and discipline. Okay, give me your heart. If I had to pick just one verse on parenting from the book of Proverbs, the main source of our biblical wisdom on this subject, it would be Proverbs 23, verse 26. Here we have the very pulse of the Bible's teaching on a father's relationship with his children, including God the Father's relationship with us, his sons in Christ. This verse provides the perspective behind all the wisdom passed from father to son in the Proverbs. In it, the father simply pleads, My son, give me your heart. This is the prime aspiration of a true father toward his children. All the advice and commands found in Proverbs flow from this great passion, the desire of a loving father for the heart of his child and for that child's heart to be given to the Lord. If you were to take the time to go through the book of Proverbs and do a word search on the word heart in that book, you would find that it comes up quite a bit. Uh, I did a search to that end and uh, I didn't, did not have time to count all the many different times it came up, probably 40 or 50 times or so in the book of Proverbs, just looking at the scrolling through the number of references. Um, and I, I picked out a couple just at the beginning that I think uh, emphasize the role of the heart in the development of a child's life. Um, in Proverbs 2, verses 1 and 2, we read, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, uh, there's an encouragement here for the child to do this so that he would be blessed and enjoy a long life and so forth. And so here the child is to uh, listen to wisdom, to incline their heart to understanding. It, it's very much focused on the heart. What is the child supposed to do? Well, he's to listen to his father's instructions. And uh, again, if you go through Proverbs, it's kind of like uh, a, a, a discipline manual for fathers in raising their sons. You find time and time again the exhortation, my son, my son. Uh, that occurs frequently throughout the book. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1 reads, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. And so the focus on the heart to keep the commandments, to listen to the teaching, um, it's a, an exhortation to the child to uh, pay attention. Uh, we quoted from Proverbs 4, verse 23, uh, you might look at Proverbs 7, verses 1 through 3, uh, just to give you a flavor of the book again. And this will be the last quote I have for you. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so you'll see through the book of Proverbs, there's this tremendous emphasis on the heart of the child. And out of the heart flow the springs of life, so it is a source, the center of our existence. It's where our emotions are, but it's also where our intellect, our thinking, our decision-making occurs. It's the, the place where our soul resides. Uh, and so it's this inner life that needs to be addressed. God is not content merely with outward behavior, with outward conformity uh, to, to his laws, but he wants the heart given over to him. And this emphasis on the heart is that which will transform the way that we uh, look at our children and try to minister to them. Uh, as Dr. Phillips is going to make clear, uh, it's not enough just simply to uh, coerce outward behavior from our child so that they conform to external norms. Uh, you want the child to embrace these things from the heart to love doing that which is right, and more essentially to love God and to love their neighbor as well as their parents. So an emphasis on the heart in the book of Proverbs there. 
uh, Dr. Phillips continues, note carefully that the proverb does not say, my son, give me your behavior. It is not difficult for us to use our authority so that our children obey us outwardly without giving us their hearts. In fact, this lowest common denominator form of fatherly leadership is, is exactly what we will fall into if we don't actively seek a different and better result. So sometimes we can impose our will on our child and the child will grudgingly go about doing what they're supposed to do, but have you really won that child's heart? Have you really accomplished a whole lot there other than use your authority and your position to compel obedience? Um, would you not much rather have a, a willing and uh, eager heart to do that which was right rather than one who is resisting and uh, uh, grumbling the whole way? Neither does the proverb say, My son, give me your physical presence, as if all that matters is placing a child in the right places at the right times. Worship, for instance, is far more than being physically present at church on Sunday morning. Although many parents content themselves with little more from their children. So it's not sufficient just to show up. Uh, the child needs to actively, personally, uh, sincerely participate in worship for themselves. Praising God, thanking Him, praying to Him, um, worshiping Him, uh, being a part of the Christian fellowship, listening to His Word, uh, coming away with a sense that this is what I need to be doing in obedience to God. And so it's not just enough to get your children to church or to put them in a Christian classroom. Um, they need to be engaged in that, that from the heart. Um, so it's not just enough to have them present at a particular location. Um, I think as we go along, uh, as I have an opportunity, I'll, I'll try to interact with some other different ways of disciplining children, raising children that you get both in the world and also in perhaps more fundamentalist or evangelical circles uh, and try to distinguish a reformed perspective on these things. I'm not sure how helpful I'll be in that regard, but I'll do what I can. I'm sure that Rick will be able to help, in too, help out too in that respect and probably have a lot to say on these matters. So. Um, Continuing, this then is the purpose of parental disciplining, excuse me, <laughs> parental discipling, ministering to our children's hearts so as to gain a relationship of love with them and a shared heart bond of faith in Jesus Christ. A father can spend years giving his child a Christian structure of church, Sunday school, Christian schooling, etc. If he then finds himself helpless as his young adult child embraces rebellion, what has gone wrong? Too often the answer is that he never aimed for the child's heart, and not aiming for it, never gained it. Now he's going to explain what this means as we go along uh, as to what it means to aim for the child's heart. You might think, well, was I not doing that to begin with? I got the child in the church service, I got the child in the Sunday school and uh, Christian school and so forth. Isn't that trying to reach the child's heart? And I would say yes, to a certain extent it, it is. Um, it, it, certainly the pastor is trying to reach the child's heart. Uh, the Sunday school teacher is, the youth worker is, um, the, the, the teacher at school, the counselors and so forth are trying to reach that child's heart. Um, it's so... so Something, though, that the father also needs to be engaged in, and especially the father, uniquely so. The father needs to be uh, engaged in the, their child's heart, and uh, not just, as it were, um, give that responsibility to somebody else and allow them to, to take over that. Um, the father needs to be involved as well. So the great issue of parental discipleship is directing the hearts of our children to the Lord. Instead of a mere focus on behavior or bodily presence, wise and loving parents seek to touch and win the hearts of their boys and girls. The question is, how? 
First, understand that the heart, even the heart of a child, can only be freely given. Excuse me, can only be given freely. It can never really be taken. In part, therefore, this is a matter of a father leading by example. We must begin by giving to our children what we seek to receive from them. Before we can convincingly plead, my child, give me your heart, it must be evident to the child we have sincerely given our own. So this really gets at the question of, do you love your child? Um, and are you concerned for that child? Are you willing to give of yourself to that child? You're not just uh, putting all the responsibility for raising the children on to your wife uh, or um, school teacher or, or what have you, but you yourself love that child, concern for that child, and, and are seeking that child's best interests. And that needs to come through. And so um, if you're not giving your heart to your child, then it's quite likely the child's going to figure that out before long. And they're going to respond by not giving their heart back to you. Okay, let's talk more about giving them your heart. Such a giving of a father's heart to a child is not a one-time event, but a continual demonstration of love, patience, grace, mercy, and dedication over time. Our children must gain from us what they most desire, our affection, our approval, our attention, our involvement, and our time. Generally, this will require us to resist the draw of other passions. Just as we have limited time and limited energy, we have limited love and a limited sphere of things to which we can give our hearts. Just as many mothers must lay aside other passions and preferences to, to serve their husbands and children, most fathers will have to curb or set aside career ambitions, recreational pastimes that do not involve their children, and indeed much of their lives apart from their families. This is what it takes to have the time and passion available to give our hearts to our children and to our wives. So uh, he, he gets at the heart of a, a father's uh, giving of his heart to his, his family. Uh, it involves uh, spending time with them, uh, looking upon their interests as uh, very significant. <clears throat> I have this feeling myself, I, I, and I suspect as fathers you've had that where um, you seem like you have little time for yourself. Um, you, you've got responsibilities to your job and you do that and you come home and your wife has a list of things that needs to be done. Your child wants attention, you know, and wants you to take them out, play ball or what have you. And sometimes you begin to wonder, well, when do I take care of myself? When do I get to do something for myself? And that gets to be a challenge, but um, part of this is a reminder that we have to lay down ourselves and our lives for our families. And uh, as uh, Chuck had been talked about, talking about in terms of our relationship with our wives, we have to deal with our own selfishness and focus on self and be ready to give of ourselves and our time, our interests to others. And so. I might be bored silly with regard to little trains, uh, but if my child loves trains, then I'm going to have an interest in them, and I'm going to try to spend some time with the child. I remember my nephews loved Thomas the Train toys, and if you were to get them something for their birthday or for Christmas, it would have something to do with Thomas the Train toys, because that's what made their lives go. And interestingly, they still love trains even at this point in their life. Now they're 13 and 15 years old or so, something like that. So, um, you, you, you take an interest in that child and you, you, you spend time with that child. Um, speaking of my own sadness and things, uh, lost opportunities, I remember, you know, when I first got my dog, Duke, I took him home from the pet store and I thought to myself, right at that point, that he's going to be here only for a limited period of time. You know, I've already had a dog that, you know, I raised him from a pup and and had to put him down at the end of life. It was a very, very hard thing. And I had this new dog, Golden Retriever, and I thought, 
I got limited time with him, so I want to make his time worthwhile. And I tried to do that, but I was not able to do as much as I want, wanted to do with many different responsibilities, and my responsibilities increased over time. And I remember towards the end, last couple of years, I would see him in the backyard, sitting in the yard, uh, looking into the kitchen where I was, waiting for me to come out and play with him. And I couldn't because I had things to do in the house or something. And it just, I just felt bad for that. Or I, you know, he'd have a ball in his mouth and want to play or something like that. And that was big. That was important for him. And I think for raising a child, just spending time with your child, playing with that child, um, playing ball, running around in the yard, laughing and, and having a good time, wrestling or something like that. Just be involved in your child. And um, that will mean the world to your child as opposed to, you know, just sending them off to school and uh, providing them with food and clothing and shelter and all these kinds of things. That's all important. But what counts for that child is your personal time and interest in that child. Okay, I think about this a lot because I am the kind of zealous person who does things like write this book. I pastor an active congregation and travel a bit to preach. This is all fine so long as it does not keep me from giving my heart to my wife and children. Is it possible for a father to lead an active, zealous, and productive work life while maintaining strong, heart-based relationships with his children? The answer is yes. It all depends on the father's heart. Is he connected with what is going on inside his son or daughter? Does he show interest and does he make time to let his children tell their endless stories about what they have been doing. If a father sincerely practices the four steps that I set out later in this chapter, read, pray, work, play, I believe he will be able to lead a very active work life without hindering his relationship with his children. But if the father frequently says, I'm sorry, I don't have time, the child will inevitably point his heart elsewhere. Some place there is interest, attention, and excitement about his or her life. It is precisely a child's deep need for a sense of belonging that explains many of the troubles of young people, everything from drugs and gangs to premature romantic entanglements. <clears throat> that, hints, that paragraph hints at the important role that fathers play in a child's heart and a child's life. Um, fathers with their daughters, a, a, a young daughter, uh, I think, builds her own self-image in view of her father's care for her and love for her and interest in her. And same thing with a, a boy. Um, a boy's confidence in, in doing things in life uh, is really benefited by having a father show an interest in that boy and taking the time to spend uh, time with that child. Uh, so um, uh, we, we do have an important role to play in our child's life. Again, it's not that God can't do something in a child uh, uh, if we're unable to be with that child, but um, it's a great blessing for the child to know that his father loves and cares for him or her. Okay, one father's example. The year 1972 was big for me for two reasons. That year I turned 12 and entered 6th grade. More importantly, though, my father spent the entire year in Vietnam. He had often been away for maneuvers or short deployments of up to a month or so. He had even done an earlier long tour in Vietnam, although I was much younger then and hadn't noticed his absence too deeply. But this time, my dad would be at war for one of my most formative years. What a hole my father's absence left in my life and the life of my mother and brother. I have many sad memories from that year. We lived in constant fear for my father's life, a fear made far more real by the fact that numerous friends' fathers had already died in Vietnam. But not all the memories are sad. One of the most powerful memories is the thrill of the letter I would receive from my father almost every week. He and my mother wrote mostly every day. Our family would make a cassette recording to send to Dad every weekend. 
what a difference the internet must make for war families today. Recalling my personal letters from Dad practically brings me to tears even now. He would simply he would begin simply by telling me about his life. Not big military issues, but neat stuff that happened or that he saw. Then he would talk to me about my life, writing things like, Dear Ricky, I heard you had a great baseball game and made a great catch. Your mother told me how exciting it was when you won. How I wish I could have been there. But I can see you making that catch in my mind. Do you see what he was doing? My dad was telling me that I was his boy and that his heart was fully engaged with me, even from halfway around the world. I knew he meant it because those letters merely carried on the same close relationship we had shared before he deployed. But make no mistake, there were rebukes too, for I was a 12-year-old boy temporarily without a father in the home. I was very displeased to hear that you have been talking back to your mother lately. You know that while I am serving our country, I count on you to be an obedient son. My father's letters discussed everything in my life, school, church, sports, and home life, the details of having been faithfully related to him by my mother. In the midst of a life-and-death war zone, and with all the weighty responsibilities of a senior army officer, my father was truly absorbed in my life, and I knew it. So when he said to me, in effect, my son, give me your heart, he had already given every bit of his heart to me, his boy. I couldn't possibly help giving my heart back to him. Um, these stories remind me of uh, events in my past where I played basketball for Philmont Christian Academy. And I remember being out on the basketball court and the ref would call a foul or not call a foul. And from time to time my father was able to come to the games and he would sit up in the stands and I would hear him yelling at the refs for <laughs> missing a call or something like that. And I thought, wow, that's pretty neat. My father coming to my defense or what have you. And uh, so I remember that. And, and I was thinking as I was reading this, um, when I was in junior college, there was a, a young woman there that I, I kind of set my heart on at that time. And I remember um, we had a softball game and I was out in left field and uh, our school was playing another school and it was just kind of a makeup thing. It wasn't a, in a league or anything. It was a softball game. And I remember being out in left field and a, a long fly ball was hit towards the foul line and I had to race over to catch it. And, you know, <laughs> I'm not used to being playing baseball so I'm running and running and as I'm running I'm seeing the ball hopping up and down in the sky <laughs> as I'm trying to get to it. And I remember I finally reached way over and, and caught the ball just before uh, going out of, out of the, beyond the foul line. I remember hearing in the background my, my friend saying, her name was Kathy, saying, um, nice catch, Rich. And I could still hear her voice in my mind all these years later because it meant a lot to me that she complimented me on that. And I remember, too, playing basketball for the school and the same sort of thing. She was one of the cheerleaders on the side, and we were warming up, and I'd be off not far from her shooting jump shots from the side. And she would say, nice shot, Rich, or something like that. You know, And those things meant a lot. You know, And I think for you, um, you probably have memories of that sort of thing, too, of people who who complimented you with something you were doing and showed an interest in you, and it, it meant a lot. And uh, think of how that could benefit. You probably don't realize it, but the way that you can benefit your son or daughter or uh, someone else by uh, expressing appreciation for something they're doing, uh, it's something that they may never forget. So he says, uh, Dr. Phillips says, I was close to my father until the day he entered heaven. I had the privilege of being at his side reading psalms aloud to him as he departed from this life. When he was buried at Arlington National Cemetery, my brother and I gave a eulogy explaining what a privilege and blessing it had been to be the son of this fine man. 
I will never forget meeting with many of his old army friends afterward. One of them, a general I had known well while growing up, looked me in the eye and said, I would give anything to have my son speak at my funeral the way you spoke about Dave today. I didn't have the heart to respond honestly because I knew him and I knew his son. His child would never speak about him the way I spoke of dad because he had not given his heart to his son and his son's heart was bitterly estranged from him. There was no point in me telling the general this, but I pray I never forget it when it comes to my own children. Um, that's certainly a sad situation. Okay. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll get into this. I'll just read the introduction to this next section on uh, what he calls four ways to reach a child's heart. We'll read through the introduction and then we'll pick up our study on that next time. Of course, not just any fatherly involvement can reach the hearts of our children. To really open up a child's heart, a father must observe the work and keep model of Genesis 2 verse 15. There must be the working as a father nurtures and cultivates the soil of a child's heart. And there must be the keeping, the correction that, as we will see in the following chapter, is to be exercised in a relationship of joy and love. I'm constantly amazed at the number of people who assure me that their fathers hardly ever praised them, but constantly criticized and berated. I meet people all the time who tell me that their fathers beat into their heads that they were losers who would never succeed. I can scarcely imagine what that is like. There's only so much a pastor can do to remedy such an upbringing, and the best he can do will include pointing such a person to the effective healing love of our Heavenly Father, who can do far more than any man. But as fathers, we can ensure that our own children are raised with the rich fertilizer of fatherly affection and esteem. Perhaps you've come across men like this who um, could never be satisfied by what their child did. Constantly made demands upon top of demands and uh, constantly raised the bar of expectation. The child meets that bar, the father raises it higher and ever higher and higher. And the child just goes through life never feeling like he could satisfy his, his father. So what's going to be the result of that? The child's going to check out. You know, why bother? Why well, try to please this man? Um, so, um, you know, some think that, well, I'm making my child tough. I'm being tough to him because it's a tough world out there and he's not going to be able to make it if he's not hardened. It's like the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue. <laughs> Father names his son Sue. <laughs> and uh, the song goes on where he finally... Uh, comes across his father and his father says, I'm responsible for the spit in your eye and the, <laughs> I don't know, the, the strength of his character or what have you. But that's um, not really the way to raise a child. He says, a godly father plants good things in the hearts of his children. He plants the seeds of his own faith in Christ. He plants a longing for truth and goodness he plants his hopes and dreams for the godly man or woman the child will become. And he plants his own confidence that the child has all the gifting and capacity needed to serve God faithfully in whatever way God may genuinely call. A godly father works these things into the soil of his child's heart as he shares his own heart, listens to and molds the child's heart, and waters these tender plants with faith and love. At the core of godly fatherhood is exactly this kind of emphasis on sharing his own heart and developing his child's heart. What can we do to forge such a parent-child bond? It is often observed, and rightly so, that quality time cannot substitute for quantity time. So what kinds of quantity time must fathers spend with their children? I have an approach to this that involves four simple categories. Read, pray, work, play. 
That is, I want to forge a relationship with each of my children as we read God's Word together, pray together, work together, and play together. Okay, so we'll develop that in the weeks to come, Lord willing. Um, so, uh, as I'm reading these last few paragraphs, I'm reminded of how I need to grow and mature. And I think that as you are raising a child, you become very much aware of your own weaknesses, uh, inabilities, and so forth, uh, shortcomings. And so raising a child at, at, at some level also involves, if you will, raising yourself, uh, preparing yourself, maturing yourself as a man, uh, and understanding the world around you, understanding God's Word and how it applies to our children and being able to communicate these things in an effective way uh, to your child. Um, that's hard. I, I think of, you know, some of you have occasions where you want to bear witness to your faith in Christ to a neighbor or friend or something like that and maybe you're at uh, the diner like I've done in the past and sit there at the, the counter with other men and you look for opportunities to lead a conversation to uh, faith in Christ and salvation and sometimes you hear some things and you just don't know what to say or how to respond to that and you know you think about it later on and maybe some uh, an idea comes along but I, I think quite often as a parent raising a child you face all different kinds of circumstances where you're not quite sure what to say and, and so uh, I think we first have to grow and mature as men ourselves in order to help our children grow and mature. And uh, so that's that's quite the challenge. Um, I need to grow intellectually, emotionally, volitionally. I need to grow in my skills. I need to grow in my communication abilities um, and in my perception of things so that I can accurately understand what's going on and then be able to apply God's Word in a way that reaches a child's heart and ministers to that child and, and makes sense to that child. Uh, the child does not have the same vocabulary that we might have, or the same um, realm of ideas to work with. And so we need to keep things simple, direct, uh, in ways that uh, um, a child understands, grabs hold of, and follows. It's kind of like Jesus with the disciples speak, speaking to them in parables, uh, kind of, if you will, dumbing down information so that they can grab hold of it in ways that are meaningful to them. And uh, so that's what we have to learn how to do. And um, so I think for ourselves, we'll need to read, pray, work at these things and uh, and exercise these things as opportunity arises. Well, I think I'll finish there. Thus saith the bachelor with no children. <laughs> I'm sure you can have complete confidence in everything I said, so... <laughs> uh, fortunately, we have a book to read <laughs> with someone who has more experience than I do. So. Uh,